Hallelujah. Praise the Lord, everybody. This is God's Mercy's Tabernacle coming to you on YouTube and uh, believing that you are going to be very blessed with us this Sunday as we celebrate the 8th of September, the second month, the second Sunday of the month. And we believe that God is going to minister to you as he is ministering to us. Uh, we thank God for the week that has gone by and uh, thankful to God uh, that you are alive, you are well. Um, and even if you are going through any challenge that you are going through, God gave us very good and uh, very, very sound, wise uh, warnings beforehand that we would go through some tough times in this life and that that should not be the reason why we give up on our faith but rather we continue to trust in the Lord who has promised us that even during those difficulties, his peace would prevail in our lives. We want to begin with a quick word of prayer so that we get into the sermon of the day. Father, in the name of Jesus, we bless and appreciate you for the opportunity to use the uh, space and uh, pulpit that you have given to us uh, to be able to offer our voice in contribution towards that which will build the body of Christ, that which will challenge the world to the salvation that is available to us by Christ, and that which, oh my God, generally speaking, will fill the airwaves with what is of the truth of the word of God. We pray that, Lord, we will speak or with the authority, with the liberty, with the joy that comes from the kingdom of God. We pray that, Lord, whatever we say will have an effect on hell, and it will have an effect on heaven, and it will have an effect in the earth. And we pray by the power of the Holy Spirit, who is given to us to help us in all work that we do for the Lord, the anointing will break every yoke of evil and everything that touches on the sinful uh, atmosphere of this world. We pray that, Lord Jesus Christ, we will be vessels of honor to be able to glorify your holy name. This we pray, believing and trusting in Jesus' name. Amen. I bless the Lord for the opportunity to share the word with us today. My name is Jonathan Steve Mwangi, pastor of God's Mercy's Tabernacle, and we are blessed uh, for the opportunity to share from the Holy Word of God on a topic that's extremely relevant to us at such a time as this. And I believe it is going to build up on what we have been sharing in the last few Sundays. We glorify God that we have peace in Kenya at this time. It's been a very, very difficult season on a general scale uh, since the times of the protests that were kind of like defining the city and the nation at a time when we were going through political upheaval. But we thank God that this far, God has been very gracious, reason has prevailed, diplomacy has prevailed, um, compromise has prevailed in the sense of people, you know, uh, being willing to give something uh, that they would desire so much to be done but give opportunity for the other person's uh, side to be able to uh, also do something to help the, from the way they see things as far as governing this country is concerned. We now have a government that has elements of the opposition uh, uh, in, in, in power working together with the government. It has eased uh, to a degree the great uh, strife and tension that was being felt in the nation. And even though there are still many things that have to be dealt with, there is a measure of order, a measure of peace, a measure of liberty to be able to continue with life uh, under a bit better circumstances than were there before. We must be very grateful for any good thing that happens. For the scripture tells us that when we pray, we should pray for those who are in authority in 1 Timothy chapter 2, so that we may be able to live peaceable lives. 
and that would please God our Savior. This beautiful Sunday service, we want to speak to us on the subject, Love Not the World. The topic or title is Love Not the World. And I believe God is going to minister to us through this word. This message is a continuation of my message, which was titled The Righteous Fall Seven Times. You can see it on our YouTube channel, this one that you are watching right now, Jonathan Steve Mwangi. And it was aimed at calling back at the time the backslider and those who are still in the fold, but living in sin and bondage to the enemy as believers. The focus today is on one specific brother who played a key role in the apostolic team of Apostle Paul, who had a specific assignment to preach to the Gentiles. When working closely with believers that you trust for a period of time, one of the worst things that can happen is when they forsake you suddenly when the journey becomes difficult. It is one thing to have an unbeliever hurt you, but totally another when someone whom you trust abandons you when you needed them the most. This is the important aspect that we are going to focus on, on Apostle Paul's life when he was abandoned by Brother Demas. And we are going to learn a little bit about not being a Demas in our day. Having people forget your kindness is common in this life, and all true believers have to pass this test. Abraham, the father of faith, looked after his nephew Lot when his father passed away, but when their growing flocks caused a territorial war between the shepherds, Abraham let Lot choose the lush pasture land next to the nearby prosperous city life, and he remained with the leftovers, so to speak. Lot loved the world more than he loved God, and his decision brought him and his family devastating losses. Uh, those of you who are not familiar, the book of Genesis has that story, that at some point Abraham, when he left his father's house, and uh, went to the land the Lord would show him uh, somewhere along the line. His nephew, whom he had gone along with, who had lost his dad, uh, they had a problem where, because they were prospering in terms of uh, livestock, uh, it was becoming a problem between the herdsmen. And the herdsmen were beginning to have issues of, this is my turf, or this is my territory, or these are our boundaries of pasture land for our livestock to feed on, and before long, it, it became too aggressive for them to be able to live with each other. We who ha live in Kenya, we know one of our most stubborn wars has to do with land that is for pastoralists, like in the area of Pokot and others, where it is such a, a big issue. Who has the land that has water, specifically rivers or uh, any water bodies that would be helpful to ensure that there is some good pasture in the land. So this is what happened with uh, Lot and Abraham. And at some point, it had to be addressed. The aggressiveness was becoming ugly. And uh, it had to be addressed because uh, they wanted to live in peace. This is an uncle and his nephew. And so it became something they dealt with in this way. Abraham said to him, what we do, here the land is before us. This side has beautiful pasture land, and this other side uh, is more or less desert-like. Uh, I want you to choose today. Whichever side you want to go, you go, and then I will take the one that you have not chosen. And so nephew, Lot, decided when he looked this way, to, uh, to, to take what was looking promising, what was looking like good pasture land. But on the other hand, later we will get to see that it was the land neighboring to the city of Sodom, the city of Zoar, 
the city of Gomorrah. These three were, you know, small cities that were, you know, in the direction <laughs> where Lot chose. Actually, the Bible says that Lot pitched his tent towards Sodom. <laughs> pitched his tent towards Sodom. Check out the story for yourself. And uh, uh, that is a, a, a kind of, you know, illustration that his heart was set on worldly pleasures. That is a, a kind of shadow or type or illustration of something that is showing where somebody's heart is leaning. And we see, therefore, that Lot loved the world more than he loved God, and his decision brought him and his family devastating losses because at some point, Lot was captured while living in that land, which he thought was the nice land. And uh, Abraham left, his uncle left, with what looks like desert land. When he was uh, getting caught up in that life, somewhere along the line, he, his family, his property were taken hostage by the kings of the land. And guess what? Ironically, it is the same uncle Abraham who came to rescue him at a great hour of need that was probably a result of his foolish decision. Because <laughs> if he wasn't there, he would not have gone through that kidnapping experience. Guess what? God used the very uncle who showed him mature kindness and said, choose what is best for you. <laughs> he used him and his 318 soldiers to rescue Lot. And the story is captured very nicely somewhere in Genesis 13 and 14. Uh, and we see Abraham turning out to be a more mature, a more sober, a more godly man at that particular, particular time of test. Demas in the New Testament is a lot like Lot, and we are going to see it very clearly. He left the likes of great men of God like Apostle Paul and Dr. Luke, who was his kind of like his secretary, whom he ministered with at a time when they needed him most. He forsook them not to go and do ministry elsewhere, which is very likely these days when, you know, you start something together, you do ministry together, you work together, and someone feels, ah, I think I have a better vision or a better way to do things, a better way to, you know, serve the Lord. You know, maybe they've gained a bit of experience and they were not exposed before. Now they have a bit of experience and they are feeling, ah, I think I can do something also. Uh, you know, sometimes, you know, that is, that is necessary to happen. The Lord gives people different directions in that sense. But when it is that they left not to do some ministry that shows there's an anointing that was upon them that is unique, like in the case of Apostle Paul, they went to pursue the pleasures of this life. In other words, backslid which is a very sad, sad story. I always say, in, in time, if you left, in time, if you left a ministry, huh? if you left a ministry out of selfish ambition, out of competition, out of a wicked motive, in time, that little foundation there it will yield some form of fruit. It will be known for what you truly had as a root uh, reason why you left that ministry. It will be known clearly to everyone what it was about. Was it money? Was it fame? Was it just to prove somebody wrong or right? Was it to just uh, enrich yourself or be, uh, you know, have a business that... Uh, takes care of your needs, you, you, it will be known. Was it about God's voice? Was it about a real assignment and call from God? It will be known. It will be known. And the anointing that accompanies you will be a stamp of approval from the Lord in due time. In due time. The work of the Lord, you don't judge it quickly. The work of the Lord, you don't judge it with due time processes and uh, 
Because at the end, every one of us will be tested by fire. It says it in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. All of us will be tested. All the ministries that began will be tested. All the servants of God who are obeying the voice of God, they will be tested. Because every ministry started with one man or a couple or one woman, <coughs> excuse me, and their husband, or a single woman or a single man. Or oh, every ministry can be traced to a pioneer, a founder, a visionary, a person who God spoke to, and they obeyed God's voice, and they left to do what God was asking them to do. And in time, it gets to be known what was the true motivation, what was the true real uh, 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 you know, intent of the heart and mind. It will be known, it will be known. And so, in Demas's case, we do not have the luxury of saying hallelujah for a brother who helped to do great work for the Lord. Instead, there is this, you know, infamous line about him being one who forsook them. <laughs> forsook, when you use the word forsake, abandon, you know, um, drop out you know, drop like a hot potato, stuff like that, it's normally negative. He forsook them, not to go and do ministry elsewhere, but to pursue the pleasures of this life. Colossians chapter 4, verse 4, this is what it says. Our dear friend Luke, the doctor, and Demas send their greetings. Our dear friend, dear friend refers to someone who you value, you treasure, you have come to know is reliable, is trustworthy, is dependable, is uh, their, their, their word, is their bond. Hallelujah. They, 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 they mean what they say and they say what they mean. You know, they become dear to you on the basis of friendship that has been tried and tested by things of life here and there. And he's saying in the same category of Dr. Luke, who was faithfully by Apostle Paul's side, writing all these letters and, and, and making observations that were important for documentation purposes uh, uh, and was very keen to write what Apostle Paul was saying. Uh, Demas was being put in that level of co-working uh, ministers uh, together with other apostolic team members. Uh, Colossians 4.4 4 is telling us there that they send their greetings, which means he's part of what's going on in Paul's life. The ministry of Paul is being effective because he has, again, those around him who are faithful, who take what he's saying seriously, who recognize his apostolic um, uh, signature, apostolic mandate, apostolic favor that is from God. It continues to say also in Philemon, verse 23 and 24, because Philemon is just one chapter, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends you greetings. And so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. So we know very clearly that Demas was part of the team that was actively involved in ministry, doing their role and playing their part as unto the Lord, so to speak. Uh, they were his fellow workers. That means they were in the apostolic team of Apostle Paul, daily involved in the struggles of ministry the challenges of ministry, the, the lacks of ministry, the, the abundances of ministry sometimes in the Lord's good time, he always allows a ministry to flourish. And sometimes he goes, he allows it to go through testings. So you can see this is a man that is tried in a sense. However, while awaiting execution for the preaching of the gospel at a very difficult time in Paul's life, uh, Apostle Paul mentions Demas in another light that is totally opposite of how he has mentioned him before. This is in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 6 to 10, where this is what he says at a very, very important time of Apostle Paul's life. He says, I am ready, uh, for I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time for my departure is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. 
Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. This is a man that is on the precipice of finishing the course of his ministry. He is aware by revelation that he doesn't have much time left. He knows that he's going to pay the highest price that we can pay in salvation, which is to die for Christ, to be a martyr. He knows that uh, this is not going to go well. He knows that um, when he reflects back, he can see that all that has been happening along, this is going to be the climax of it. He can tell that he has to finish strong. He can tell he has to be mindful now not to be a castaway and lose his ministry and calling and run away from what he would be most afraid of. And even Christ himself was afraid at that particular moment when he was about to face Calvary's cross. And so this is something normal. But he's saying something very, very important. I have finished the race. I have fought the good fight because it is a good fight to live for Christ. It is a good fight. It's a good warfare to war. Hallelujah. He said, I have kept the faith. And he knows, like it is said in scripture, there comes rewards in the afterlife. That crowns are one of the things we are assured of for those who will remain faithful to the very end. And he says in verse 9, do your best to come to me quickly for Demas, because he loved this world, has deserted me and has gone to Thessalonica. Whoa! Who is talking? Apostle Paul. The man who has been entrusted with at least 13 and a half epistles of truth out of 27 of the New Testament. That's great stewardship authority God gave this man. What is he saying? He's saying, I'm about to finish my time here. You know, I've said this before, when people are about to die and they are great men or great women in terms of this life, in terms of assets that they own or estate, you know, everybody wants to know what is this person going to say at the end of his journey or her journey? Who are they going to bless? Who are they going to curse? Who are they going to leave everything they have on this life? Many people in this world are very keen around the inheritance time, that time when they can see the great patriarch, the great matriarch, or whoever, you know, is about to leave. They want to know what did they say last. I have seen people carry out to the letter instructions that were left by people at their deathbed to the letter, even if they are strange and many times even demonic, because they hold that word with great weight, what the person will have said as final instructions. What is Apostle Paul saying at his hour of great need? I think I need something from the brethren. Come very quickly and do so because <laughs> someone I was relying on someone who was probably here for ministering to me or who was making sure he visits the jail very often and was great strength to me, I have now learned very, very, very convincingly and from credible sources that he left the apostolic ministry, the team that he was part of very, very, very strongly so as a fellow worker, he has left it not to do something for Christ, but to go back to what? The pleasures of this world. And to which city did he go to? Thessalonica. Wow. Let me tell you a bit about Thessalonica. Thessalonica was a large and wealthy cosmopolitan city which offered all the pleasures of this world. Probably a Nairobi of this day, a Las Vegas of America, or a Mumbai of India, or 
a Beijing of China? I don't know. However, it is famously known, founded in 316 BCE, which is before Christ, and named for a sister of Alexander the Great, who is talked about in history as a great man, great general, Thessaloniki, the sister, and it was after 146, was the capital of the Roman province of Macedonia. And as a military commercial station, <clears throat> excuse me, on the Via Ignatia Road, which was a very famous road, which ran from the Adriatic Sea east to Byzantium, that is Constantinople. Again, history people will remember such names of such great cities of those times. It grew to great importance in the Roman Empire. So it was a popular city. It was a city with high cash flow. It was a city that was well known as cosmopolitan, which means people from different nations dwelt there. So it was very, very suitable for business, suitable for people who want to invest in their, in their you know, uh, they um, to invest their monies in things that would be promising. It probably was an American dream type of dream city. You know, the way people say we are going to America for the, eh, the, the, the city. We are going to the, to the nation of dreams, uh, the capital of dreams, Washington. We are going to, uh, uh, to New York, the famous city. <clears throat> so it was a very, very popular city. <clears throat> Thessalonica was also a city of sin. Uh, the nickname for Las Vegas is the Sin City. Uh, same, I think, to Johannesburg and other cities that are known so much because not only of their, you know, ability to uh, be a, a great places of investment, but also to be places of entertainment and the pleasures of sin, where you'll find gambling, discourse, and all kinds of things that are of sensual nature, sinful nature, offered in those cities. Uh, Thessalonica was a city of sin. Most of the people worshipped idols there. It had been a captivated city by idol worship. In fact, if you compare 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 9, and you compare it also with the city of Corinth, which was known to be same, same way, a city of sin, particularly the sin of immorality. The city was filled with all kinds of wickedness and the sin of fornication was a great problem, just as it was in Corinth. Compare that with 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 1 Thessalonians 1, 9, and 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 3. They tell you prominent sins of the city. They tell you what was the, the idle talk of the city? Every city has what characterizes it. Some cities are known for their drunkenness. Other cities are known for their prostitution. Others are known for uh, the discourse that they have. And people will fly many miles, travel on ships, road, rail, you know, to, to come to be in a city to have fun. You remember on October 7th, there was a, a, a festival of music going on in Israel outside the outskirts of the city of Tel Aviv. And, and it is there that these, you know, barbarians of Hamas came and slaughtered, you know, 260 young people who were having, so to speak, fun. And that war has been going on to this day. And now as we speak, there has been more than 2,000 people of Israel uh, killed and more about 40,000 of the Palestinians killed as a result of what was happening on the day of October 7th when an ambush was laid by Hamas on the people of Israel. Thessalonica, just like it was said when people were very immoral, it was said that they have been Corinthianized. <laughs> well, Thessalonic, Thessalonica also had that kind of reputation. Someone had been Thessalonicad if they had been converted, so to speak, into the sensual lifestyle that was available in the city. 
Demas became a part of that which was the identity of Thessalonica as a backslidden brother. There was a great problem of idleness among the believers as we would read in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 6 to 15. The, this is where you will find Apostle Paul addressing those who are idle in the congregation who seem to have no work and are not interested in working. And even if they are given the opportunity to work, they will kind of find excuses and escapists to run away from responsibility and choose to be those who are, so to speak, waiting on the Lord in prayer, seeking his face and uh, uh, not want to be caught up in the things of this world. And therefore they were lazy. They were sloths. They didn't want to work with their hands in quietness and bring something of income, not only to their families or to their, their, their loved ones, but or, or even to the, to the church of Jesus Christ. But they were becoming idle, babblers, busy bodies, a lot of talk in open spaces, lazy, lazy. Have you seen in these cities uh, where you have people who they are just seated there chatting away, people who look like they should be running a whole family of 14 people, <laughs> and they are there with their long beards, you know, just sitting and whiling away the day, waiting for the latest gossip waiting for the latest story, the latest political thing, when it was Mandamano last, and this and the other. And they are going nowhere, doing zero, probably mama's boys, still living in their parents' home at 44, 48, and they are going nowhere. These kind of people were many in Thessalonica. Hmm? People who were so to speak, like Mwai Kibaki would have said, huh? Eh? Useless, so to speak. And these things, Apostle Paul addressed them in a whole number of uh, verses, nine verses of them. First Thessalonians chapter 3. I don't want to get into that, you know, deep discussion uh, because my focus is on, you know, the wildliness of a brother. But uh, take time to look and see what Apostle Paul was addressing there in Thessalonica. See? The desire to more enjoy a laid back and fantasy filled life you know people like those who are just seated doing nothing they're always talking about what's what know city but it is doing zero <laughs> zero that Mercedes will never come huh? it's just a fantasy it's a fantasy filled life oh where they just wish and wish and wish and wish and wish and do nothing for it, you know? That desire to enjoy a more laid back, passive lifestyle, filled with uh, uh, wishes and dreams and co covetousness of, hey, 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 this, this is the kind of life they were talking about there. And uh, having friends who have money, who come and park their vehicles, and you come and sit in their vehicles, and chat away at nothing, doing nothing, aiming for nothing, and achieving nothing. Hmm? He chose to become settled and even established. <laughs> huh? Established in the city of Thessalonica, in the pleasures of the city. <clears throat> I, he probably was saying, is it so wrong to sample the good life? Look what our Christianity is doing to us. Hmm? I believe when you are, you are, your heart has been won over by that worldly lifestyle, you begin to frown and begin to criticize the life that you are planning to live or have left already. Because when he looked at Paul in comparison <clears throat> to the city of Thessalonica, he saw the sacrifice of serving the Lord alongside this man of God will be too much on him. And probably had relatives who are warning him and who are telling him, Weh, chunga sana, you are being in ministry with Paul. Utaona kivumbi, ule mtu bwana hana pesa yule. Ah, utakiona wewe. Ah, 
Sule alikuwa kamiti juzi, siju alikuwa wapi pale, aliwekwa ma, alichapwa maviboko siku nyingine pale hivi, siku nyingine alikuwa sharushiwa mawe bana, akawa ameachwa nikaa amekufa. Utajiunganaje na mtu kama huyo wewe? Una akili wewe? Ubongo wako ni decoration jameni, ni maua tu umekalia hapo juu ya shoulders zako ama vipi? <laughs> The tongue of the people who criticize the gospel can be very sweet and very practical and very real, man. See? There was so much suffering involved in the ministry, and yet <laughs> the reward that Apostle Paul was waiting for shortly was to be beheaded by the Roman authorities. <laughs> Is this how God takes care of his servants? Probably that's what Demas was being asked by his buddies. Is this how ministry huh, blesses the people who serve in it? Uh, is this what comes out of ministry? Man, <laughs> shipwreck, being, being in, in, in the water day and night, floating on a log because of a mission for Jesus Christ. <clears throat> hmm? Is that what you, you are going to live for, man, Demas? Think about it, brother. <laughs> this life, man, God. Uh, probably they quoted scriptures for him like, you know, the lot of every man from Ecclesiastes is to eat and drink what he has labored for in this life and enjoy the life and glorify God for it. Huh? <laughs> is that what you want to live for, brother Demas? Paul is 65 now. You are just in your 30. Uh, is that a yoga? Have you even reached 48? Ah, come on. Don't waste your life. <laughs> I'm just, you know, paraphrasing, adding my little uh, uh, contribution to what I know life can offer you in terms of bad advice uh, at a time of great, great decision making. Now, we are not told how long Demas went through conflict of heart or wrestled with his double-minded loyalty before he caved in <clears throat> to the allure of the city life. See, we don't know. How long was it? A month? Two months? Three months? Three years? We don't know. Scholars will try to calculate all these times and say, Probably because he was in Athens this time and he was in Corinthians this time. Maybe this period when he passed through Thessalonia up to now is about this time. We are not so sure. What was going on in the brother's life as he was seeing what was happening to this great apostle who was his friend and his mentor? Hmm? Neither are we told if he got tired of the world and returned to serve the Lord later. We are not told that. We are not told that in the scriptures. However, our last legacy of Demas is that he left Paul when he was in prison and awaiting death. That's what we know of the brother. Therefore, two things that I want to mention here that are an observation. And that we will close this message. Number one, though Demas was in ministry with his friend and mentor, which is a good place to be, his personal relationship with the Lord must have been very weak because he also forsook Christ while living the servant of God. See? You see, if he, if he so to speak, abandoned Paul, but next thing we are hearing is Demas started a ministry. And he continued and probably was even talking about the, the servant of God who he, knows is about to, who he knows is about to die for the faith and saying, I'm continuing where? <laughs> my mentor, my spiritual father, Apostle Paul, left off with the message that is everlasting, that of Christ Jesus. No, we are told he went for the pleasures of the world. <laughs> He went back to sensual living. He went back to drunkenness, probably. Went back to fornication and adultery and whatever. Went back to um, Mokokai and, and Busa and of his days. Went back to uh, shots 
and of tequilas and all that and, and uh, uh, getting down in the Sherehe shere houses of his day. <clears throat> what a fall. What a, what a sad thing to have happened. A mighty man of God, a mighty woman of God who was a blessing to the body, who was establishing the work of the Lord, who was building others in their faith, who was together with a, a, a strong ministry team and was, 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 was being used of God to help others in their faith to look up and say, if Demas can do it, I can do it. Such a person going back, brethren, to the world and settling there. You know, it's not alianguka, alafuakarudi. It is settled, <laughs> established. Amerudi nyuma na yo story meishi hapa. Because we are not told if he returned. Maybe, thinking about it in reflection, maybe he substituted being with and listening to Apostle Paul with being with the Lord and listening to the voice of the Lord. I hope you got my point. You know, it is a good thing to be around a mighty man of God, a mighty woman of God, somebody who, whose life and example are such a blessing, whose life and example have helped you shape your convictions, shape your understanding of scripture, shape your understanding of Christendom or the kingdom of God or, or how to approach deliverance ministry or how to approach the teaching ministry or how to approach the apostolic ministry or how to approach the prophetic ministry or how to be able to rise and grow and be nurtured into the prophetic ministry, which are all important ministries or a, 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 such a mentor evangelist that has raised you and helped you to understand how to be able to organize a crusade and, and, and be effective and win hundreds to the laws uh, to, to, to the Lord uh, or from the lost uh, uh, kingdom of, the, of this world. It's good. It's good to be around people like those because you see, we need to be raised in the ministry. There is no doubt about it. There is no doubt about it. There's a difference between growing in the forest and being, uh, and being planted and raised in a farm. Those things are very different. In the forest, you are left to the wild and you turn out wild. But when you are raised in a farm, huh? you, uh, you grow in a raised, properly, you know, secured environment, nurtured and mentored, so to speak, by a farmer. And you come out refined and you come out with order. And you come out looking like someone who has come from a home, so to speak. It's important to have people like that who raise us. And, and we, I assure you, that is the only way you produce fruit of the same nature. That's very good. But could it be that he hailed and, and, and placed Apostle Paul to a place where uh, when he saw I... He huduma haitoa ile kitu ya anataka. He began to feel mm, discouraged. And his eyes were so much on Paul until he wasn't spending time with the Lord Jesus Christ and listening to the Lord Jesus Christ who also quietly works in us both to will and to do of his good pleasure. You see, Jesus is the vine. We are the branches. It's not Apostle Paul who is the vine. And then we are branches. No, it's Jesus who is the vine. We are the branches. Read it in John 15 verse 5. It is also clear from scripture that my sheep, they hear my voice. That is Jesus speaking in John 10, 27, which means... Ultimately, there must be a listening beyond the servant of God we are under, beyond the apostle who raised us, beyond the prophet who raised us, beyond the teacher who raised us. There must be complementing 
type of understanding that Christ is having everything I'm receiving here, confirming that it's okay, confirming that it's okay. And even if that person departs from the path of righteousness, I am left intact with my Christ. This is extremely important. We have tried to emphasize that. That is what keeps you from being in a cult. Because when you are in a cult, and your hope and dreams are everything that this servant of God is or was, I assure you, even when that servant dies or has to be moved away from you, you don't know how to live your walk with the Lord anymore. Because you are so tuned to that servant until you don't know how to live your Christian walk anymore. Apostle Paul said a very powerful thing in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1. Follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. What does that mean? It means ultimately the one you are a follower of is not Paul. It's not Apollo. <laughs> it's not Kimani. It's not Waweru. It's not Omondi. It's not Helen. It's not Vicky. The, the one you're supposed to follow, you are called a follower of Jesus Christ. And that is why Apostle Paul ushered people to say, as long as I am with Christ, it's okay, follow me, because ultimately you're still following Jesus. But the day I leave Jesus, I give you permission, Nisari, so to speak, if I can put it that way. Too many people are bound up in organizations, ministries, and all kinds of things which the truth of the matter is the man, woman who started this thing, all those who followed him later have gone on a tangent that is out of scripture, have gone out of the soundness of doctrine, have left certain important emphasis like holiness without which no man shall see God. Until now, they have something that is uniquely an identity that is scriptureless. And then they take people in a strange direction. And unfortunately, such people, for some reason, they are very popular. And they have masses following them. Huge numbers following them. And yet they can see very well. They left Christ long ago. And they are with this man. We have some examples even in our nation. People who talk about nyotas. I will restore your nyota to you. <laughs> I will nitakurudishia nyota yako. Ama nitakusaidia tunyanganye mwingine nyota yake. My friend, you left Jesus long ago. <laughs> Even though your person dresses in white, you left him long ago. <laughs> because you are you substituted the Lord of the work for the work of the Lord led by this servant of God and now you have been left Jesusless, Christless. Ministry activity cannot replace loving the Lord. Mm. Listen to what I'm saying. The only revelation Jaduong. Eh? Ministry activity cannot replace loving the Lord. You can't be removed from Christ. Loving him as the person who is your savior and end up saying you are still in ministry. It is impossible for you to have the blessing, favor, and authority of God when you go that way. Hanging out with the spiritually mature is wise, yes, but it must never replace the practicing of the presence of Jesus for ourselves as individuals. We need to individually nurture God and be jealous for our relationship with the Lord. Don't gauge your Christianity by how well your servant of God is doing. No, it's a deception. You must cultivate your own success in growing in the Lord. See? We must establish and protect such spiritual disciplines as ingesting the word for ourselves, 
listening to the word for ourselves, reading the word for ourselves, studying the word for ourselves and, and, and accessories that would help us like commentaries and things like that, that will build us as individuals and meditating on that which we are ingesting because those two things are very different. Meditating means thinking about it, weighing it and applying it in life and the situations that you are facing of life. See, meditating on that word and then having a personal prayer life, not having a strong cash of the ministry, strong Bible study of the ministry, strong Sunday service of the ministry, but you have nothing as a person. Maybe Demas, that is what happened to him. Maybe, I don't know. But I'm thinking that is likely because you see it when people begin to be that way in their own lives today. Not having a personal worship life. Things you love to, songs you love to sing in worship to the Lord for yourself. Hymns that you love for yourself. You know, scriptures you love for yourself. Prayer times you love for yourself, for you and your God. Maybe that is what was happening. And also looking for fellowship with believers around. You can't say, I only fellowship with this servant of God. It's good when you have a strong servant of God around you, but you also have fellowship with people at your level, fellowship with people at office, fellowship with people in school, fellowship with people around you. And that's why you must choose your friends carefully. Hallelujah. See? You see, the pool of the world is very real and very strong. Very real and very strong. And in fact, let me say it like this. It's in your face. Immediately you wake up, the world confronts you. It doesn't give you a chance to zuba, to relax and think at your own time, how do I want to handle things in this life now? No, it just comes one thing after another, one thing after another, social life, political life, education life, family life, relative life, social, everything comes, shoom, 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 business life, shoom, shoom, shoom. They just follow each other. There is no space for you to play games. See? The pull of the world is very real and very strong. <clears throat> Spiritual warfare is also very real. You men, there are some things you deal with. Oh, ooh. you look and you just see up and he see if it will come out and then a deal now. He in the only side tell you what came on my people Zake who are now on my case now. The Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, rulers, and and powers in the high places. Man, it's not a joke. And I assure you, nobody is immune to the wiles and schemes of the devil, man. They are so there, so subtle, so many, so unrelenting, so restless, so continuous, so enduring, so persevering. In fact, 1 Corinthians 10, 12, Apostle Paul tells us, if you think you are standing firm, watch out lest you fall. Let me tell you, nobody is immune to the worldly power that sucks and seduces people, man. That is one thing that I observed. The second thing for Demas is this. There must have been a quiet sin or sins in his heart, not manifest even to the workers around him, that he was justifying quietly, nurturing secretly, which manifested when the matching sensual atmosphere of Thessalonica was now accessible to him. It awoke when they walked into the city of Thessalonica. It awoke something in him. He said, wow, this is a city I would love to be in. Something that he justified. Something in the heart, because the heart is secretly very wicked, secretly very fallen, secretly subtly. Huh? having agendas which hmm? were being nurtured rather than brought to the mirror of the word they were being hidden you know i can i can i can show you i have this glass of water but i can also pretend i don't have a glass of water and you won't know and i will look at you like this and you don't know but i have a glass of water see this is something that all of us have to address every so often 
and allow God to help us because we ourselves are disqualified. This is one of the themes that we have under the theme of seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness in 2024 as a ministry. We have this season where we had these protests where I was feeling the Lord saying, you need a divine national surgery of the heart of Kenya. <laughs> See, the heart is desperately wicked. There are things in Demas's heart that loved sensuality and excused it or justified it. See? May the Lord help us all. This thing or things in his heart must have worn his heart over when he compared what was happening to them in ministry with the thrill of city life. There is something that we justify in our hearts that uh, usually comes in the form of something like, um, you know, a, 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 a little fantasy we have always enjoyed. See? These are things that we justify in our hearts and that make us vulnerable to a Thessalonica of our day. See? For example, a sensual friend. Always dressed like the world, talks like the world, argues like the world, responds with attitude like the world, and is always talking about haters like the world, and ignoring the haters, which means even ignoring people with genuine criticism. That could be very helpful. Maybe that's the kind of friend you have, and you justify and you cover it, and you give yourself excuses and fortify yourself that you are okay in doing what you do. Or maybe it is a rich and worldly relative who, when you are with them, they make you feel, now life is life. <laughs> life is really life, man. All the things that we cool people, we cool people <laughs> have access to now. Maybe it's that kind of a relative. They always have everything they want, whenever they want. And so you have access because they love you to all these things. And so it's like you have this thing you can fall back to whenever Christianity is boring and all these things are boring. You know, I fall back to this one, but then it starts to take you over, take you over slowly. Or maybe it's a deep longing to be rich so that when you are around the rich, you admire them. And you feel, wow. Maze kuwa na pesa si mbaya. Maze chums, maze banko tuch, kuwa na pesa altas. Money, it's good to have money. You know, people sing about money, talk about money all the time. And comment about those who have money all the time. And, and discuss how that flashing beautiful car has passed by all the time. Until slowly, slowly, quietly, subtly. You begin to long so deeply for this life until when you are with those who are in the Christ Christian kingdom and things are not working well. You long. The pull, the, ta huh? the tug, <laughs> the tug is <laughs> and pulling you and you find yourself <laughs> and you are gone. Thessalonica. Swallows you. See? Or maybe it's something that is sinful, but we love to watch or listen to because it gives us the dopamine effect. Sister Janice was ministering one time and she talked about the dopamine releasing effects of some of the things that we do. The dopamine chemical that is released when you watch a certain program, the dopamine chemical that is released when you engage in certain entertainment or you listen to certain music, a release that comes that is so addictive, just like a cigarette or for a person who is an, a, a, a cigarette addict or an, a, a, an, an alcohol beverage that addicts you, just it's the same, same way. A dopamine releasing program on TV, a dopamine releasing show, video game, something, anything that can make you become addicted until you start to totter and to, and to yumba yumba. 
in your faith and be swayed like Demas. And then Thessalonica with an open mouth. Ah, like the Astro World concert of Travis Scott with an open mouth of his head there at the entrance. It swallows you. Ah, and you find Apostle Paul saying about you that brother Jonathan huh, forsook me and left me to go back to the world. Mm. Or maybe it is a strong need to be famous. <laughs> there are people who are very honest. They'll just tell you live to Amazon. Me, hit TikTok views one million bars. I'm settled now. So they are willing to do anything to get the one million views. Dressing a small little thing that's not even a skirt, it's a belt. You know, and then exchange their leg like that and sit like this and like the other. So they know men will watch this. Ding, ding, and the likes are increasing. And you want to be known and famous. Or maybe it's the way you eat. And you, there's a way you chew that is so nice and sensual. Um, um, I really enjoy this food. Um, and you have views and views and views and views and views. And you are willing to do anything to be famous. That thing will lead you to be a Demas if you are not careful. Or maybe it's a deep jealousy for those who are beautiful and successful. And doing well in life. Scripture says. That which. Men love. Many times. God. Disdains or hates. With a heavy hatred. <laughs> that which is popular among men. God considers a blasphemy. Many times. You have to be very careful in this world. Men that these things don't catch your heart. And arrest you. See. Or maybe it is juicy gossip and slander. There's even a, <laughs> a magazine called Nairobi Gossip. I'm sure in every city they have that. Yeah, they, where it just talks about the celebrities and all the sexy people and all the handsome people and all the ones who have a net worth of uh, billions in dollars, in euros, in the currency of your country. And they have this car and the other car and a fancy beach house uh, and they swim every day and they have a night routine before they sleep and they and their beauty routine when they wake up. And, they, you know, those things, they, they are just juicy gossip talking about the beautiful, the successful, the handsome, the rich, and those who make headlines, see? Or maybe it's just a passive attitude towards our walk with the Lord. Haven't prayed for the last 16 months. Haven't opened a scripture to ingest it meaningfully in my inner spirit or listen to the word, you know? And it's not bothering you. So what happens is the lack of truth, the lack of communication with he who is the truth always leaves room for somebody else to occupy that space with their voice, with their counsel, with their advice, with their opinion. And so slowly you become worldly. You're not even aware of it. It's a very gradual thing because of being passive or casual in attitude towards our building our spiritual life in the Lord. You see, <clears throat> the heart of man has the capacity to hide behind excuses in such subtle ways that it even surprises us when scripture shows us who we really are. Because the Bible is a mirror and it can shock you with the contents of what are inside you when it is placed in front of you meaningfully. You will stand before the mirror and see you gained weight. You have seven pimples. Your teeth are yellowish. You will start to see, Haya, what? I didn't know I had dark eye shadows under my eyes and that my nose is growing funny over here. It starts to show you who you really are because you spend time meaningfully before the mirror of God's word. This is what Jeremiah has to say about the heart. A key scripture during this devotional season of national surgery, 
divine national surgery. The heart is deceitful. Above all things, and it's desperately wicked. It has wicked intentions, wicked motives, wicked attitudes. Who can know it? Even the, the prophet is saying, who, who, who can understand the heart of a human being? Verse 10, I, the Lord, search the heart. This is why you must bring your heart to the operation table of the word of God. He will reveal to you who you are. I try the reins. In other words, I check the motives. I check the attitudes. I check the intentions. I check the imaginations and the fantasies that you have, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. Let me read some examples of those who are overcoming the pleasures of this world. Hebrews 11, 24, verse 26. Sorry, Hebrews 11, verse 24 to 26. This is a powerful scripture in the book that I call the Hall of Faith. Just like there's a Hall of Fame in Hollywood, there's a Hall of Faith in the Bible where it lists the great men of faith, the great women of faith. And it, uh, so to speak, has a wax museum of them standing there as examples of those who thrived under difficult circumstances in their Christian walk with the Lord. Moses is listed there. Would I be listed there with you? Would you be listed there if the book of Hebrews were to continue in chapter 11? Verse 24 says, Hebrews eleven twenty four. 24, by faith Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter refused to be known. In other words, I'm not identifying with this Jinaya Udosi anymore called Pharaoh. Mm -mm. Nimesare. <laughs> How many of us would leave? You know, people say, I know people. So if you are a, a child, imagine if you are a child of the late Charles Njonjo, you want to be known as eh? <laughs> Eh? Why Kimori Njonjo? And everyone immediately they see the name Jonjo. They say, ah, niwale wakina Njonjo, maze ule mdosi ule, you see? And here he's, the Bible is telling us, Moses dropped the name of the popular celebrity and he chose not to be called Pharaoh's daughter anymore. Verse 25. He chose instead to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin because the palace or the White House or the State House of Pharaoh was well known to carry every conceivable luxury, pleasure, and sinful, sensual thing that was available to man. He called them fleeting pleasures of sin. They are fleeting. They, they seem okay during the five minutes, the 10 minutes, the 20 minutes, the one hour that you are enjoying them. But once you are done with them, they are so fleeting, they are forgotten. <laughs> Verse 26. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt. Come on now. Ooh, preach, man. Because he was looking ahead to his heavenly or eternal reward. That is called eternal reflection. You reflect eternally rather than momentarily or temporarily. You begin to ask yourself the question, if the play is eternal life, why am I majoring on the rehearsal? <whistles> Just like Demas. Because Thessalonica sucked him in. And it's just a rehearsal, boss. <laughs> Look at this one. The very same apostle we are talking about. What is more, Philippians chapter 3 and verse 8. I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For whose sake I have lost all things. Apostle Paul is saying I am ready. I have, in fact, lost all things. See, by the time he was in that prison in Rome, <laughs> he didn't even have a single title deed to a house or a log book to a donkey, if they had log books. <laughs> he had nothing. <laughs> eh? yeah, let me put it in Kikuyu. Darare na ido. Darare na kedo. 
Apostle Paul is such a rebuke to the likes of Kanyaris and all these people who major and Apostle Nganga and major and major and major on having things and money and, and insulting people and calling them ngombe because they brought small offerings and stuff like that. Man, no, it is even a shame for them to be called apostle or bishop or what. Man, it's a shame. It's, a, it's an insult to what eh, ordained positions in Christianity are about. It is such an embarrassment that such people can be given Huh? platforms to speak on television and all. It is a mess. They cannot be anywhere near men like these who died for the faith in prison. Man, he says, I consider them garbage, rubbish, cow dung in King James English that I may gain Christ. But these men I'm talking about and they are in public, so I'm not gossiping. They, they speak loudly. They are on TikTok clips here and there uh, as famous men of God. They, in fact, would have insulted Apostle Paul for losing everything to gain Christ. Because for them, having Christ only without those things is actually garbage. Truth be told. My God, help us. Romans chapter 8 verse 18 Apostle Paul continues to say, while seated in a Roman jail, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. <laughs> See, when you are solid in your faith, heaven is more prominent than earth. And even if you are occupying on the earth for heaven, heaven is still more prominent. <laughs> it's more prominent. The rewards in heaven are more prominent in our lives. See, because we are living in a world that is increasingly hostile towards Christians and uh, to, towards biblical values. Huh? Jesus warned us about this beforehand when he said we would go through trouble, afflictions. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. He, however, gives us peace to hang in there. Peace that is real while those things are going on. Peace that keeps you strong in the, in the things that you are facing. And he, however, gives you peace to hang on there unto the end. And then for those who make it to the end, a crown of righteousness. Oh, hallelujah. This is such an important message. I don't think we can overemphasize it. Look at what he continued to say now to his spiritual son, Timothy, who did not forsake him, but continued on in the faith. He says, verse 8 of Timo, 2 Timothy 4, Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. James, the half-brother of the Lord, now comes to tell us. Verse 12 of chapter 1, James 1, 12. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial. Demas, you should have persevered under trial because having stood the test, the person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. Apostle Paul was beheaded, yes. It was terrifying, yes. It was tormenting and traumatizing, yes, to even think about it. But guess what? Immediately that was happening. If your eyes would have been open in the spirit, you would have seen the brother on his knees before Jesus and Jesus placing a crown of eternal life upon the head of his servant. Ooh, hallelujah. Verse 13 of James 1, it says, when tempted, no one should say God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Any falling we have ever fallen, never blame God. It is somewhere, us, with a justified secret sin of the heart that ended up seduced and pulled into that very thing. And even if we try to justify how it happened, 
at the end of the day, it was your own evil desire that enticed you. Verse 15. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, gives birth to death. Demas ended up a cold, turkey, dead brother. You could not even call him brother anymore. He was just Demas or Dima. Aniaja Dima. Very sad. Lastly, I want to read the scripture that is carrying the title of this sermon to close. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 to 17 says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. I say it again. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Don't pitch your tent towards Sodom like Lot. Don't get stuck in Thessalonica like Demas. Move on like Apostle Paul, even if it's a prison jail of Rome for Christ. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lusts of the, the flesh, the lusts of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires will pass away, but whoever does the will of the Father or the will of God lives forever. The Bible never hides who we are. It shows Paul for who Paul was. And he too had struggles so that he wrote in Romans 7, the things I want to do, I find I'm not doing them. And the things I don't want to do, I find myself doing them. But he went beyond that. You may be struggling now. You may even have abandoned the Lord now. But does that mean you die at that address and settle and be established in that Thessalonica? No. Stand up, brother. Stand up, sister. Dust yourself and say, man, I've been excusing myself too long to have been backslidden. Huh? You probably went back to very, very, very eh? demonic things which you used to preach against, which you used to say, how can I be involved in something like this? How can I be with this kind of person or people? <laughs> well, don't just sit there and say, ah, nilai maisha, maisha imeni lemea, imeni fix, imeni sort. No, stand up, brother. Stand up, sister. Decide. Mimi na Dimas, we are not in the same WhatsApp group. I am going to dust myself. And what my mentor stood for, Apostle Paul and his Christ, I am going to take up again. And I am going to pick up my cross and continue following Christ until the very end. And count it all joy, even if I have to die for my faith. Love not the world. Scripture in the same James continues to say, He that is a friend of the world, pitched their tent towards Thessalonica or Sodom of the world, is an enemy of God. Don't be God's enemy. Trust the Lord. Rise up. Pick yourself up. Just like I said in the first message, a righteous man falls seven times, but the Lord picks him up again. Or rather, he, he rises again. If you stretch your hand like that, please help me, Lord Jesus. We see it very clearly. Peter, when he said, Jesus, help me, his hand was grabbed by Jesus and he was pulled out of the stormy sea by the Messiah who walked on water. <laughs> Hallelujah. So this is your time. This is your time. Quit being a Demas and stick with Apostle Paul of your day or your circumstance. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Father, blessed be your holy name, O Lamb of God, who was slain from the foundations of the world, that he might be a propitiation for us in our sinful condition and be able to meet the standard requirement of the Father 
which was holiness without which no man shall see God. We embrace the holiness of Jesus on our behalf and choose to follow the way of holiness regardless of what we are facing, regardless of the circumstances which sink us in a miry clay of our Thessalonica. Pull us out of the murkiness of Thessalonica. In the mighty name of Jesus, pull us out of the city of sin. Pull us out of Sodom and Gomorrah, Lord, and bring us to the place where, Father, we can continue in the faith journey that, Lord Jesus Christ, many of your servants in Hebrews 11 chose to leave the pleasures of this world and to follow after the difficult path of righteousness, but that leads to the real play of eternal life in, of glory in Christ Jesus. Bless our listeners or our viewers and pray, Lord, you will help all of us to come out of being a Demas in our generation. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.